Welcome to Power Boat Talk, the podcast where we talk everything performance boats with your host, Joe Rode. Hi, welcome to Power Boat Talk. Today I've got a really special guest as always. I'm here with uh, Mr. Eric Nordsgog. Eric is currently the CEO of Onnit Pro, a company that manufactures high performance watercraft uh, care and maintenance products. And Eric's past has been, uh, he, he's a boat racer, uh, grew up obviously in the Nordskog family, a very famous family, a uh, uh, family that owned Powerboat Magazine. Um, Eric's uh, obviously been around for quite a while. Eric's got a great Facebook page now where he does tributes to his grandfather, Bob Nordskog, and Powerboat Magazine. So, so check those out. But uh, that'd be great to talk to Eric and, and kind of hear his story and, and hear how he got all involved. So thanks for coming on, Eric. Happy to be here, Joe. So, CEO of Onnit Pro, why don't, you, why don't you tell us what that's all about and what your day-to-day -day is like these days? Well, Onnit Pro is kind of a small little side business that I've been doing for about 17 years. Um, oh, it all wow. kind of started um, uh, when I went to the Miami Boat Show many years ago. And it might have been Courtney Smith, I think, uh, introduced me to a fellow who had this uh, amazing product line and they were the manufacturer. And what happened was um, I've been a surfer and surfing all my life. And, and uh, basically what we did is we created a special line of products for the surfing and paddling industry. Um, and which it actually crosses over into the Marine industry because this particular company is a Marine manufacturer of these type of products. But I, I received the exclusive rights to the surfing and paddling kind of, um, you know, group of people. So it's a terrific line of products. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's award winning um, cleaners that that uh, clean all the oxidation off of uh, any watercraft, basically takes the oxidation off um, minor scratches. Uh. You fast boat guys like you're always looking for that extra tenth. The extra half a mile an hour and you know hey give it a give it a try let eric know how it works out he'll always take testimonies i'm sure awesome awesome well hope hope we get some of those guys out there giving it a whirl so yeah i appreciate that Joe. well Thank cool no cool cool i i i know you've been an entrepreneur uh which kind of runs in the family right for a long time i know you had the z-bug thing and and oh, yeah. at uh north sky performance products and you were doing the speedometers for years which we'll get to that but so, so I want to know, you know, obviously you wake up one day and you're part of this amazing performance boating family. Um, at what age did you kind of realize like, wow, this is, this is, this is something I'm, you know, we're doing here. Well, probably like four years old <laughs> because every year, <laughs> you know, at that time that was in the, I was born in 1961. So, um, my grandfather started running the, um, marathon halls where he created the viking spirit boat but his very first uh major win was the uh in 1965 he won the the parker nine hour enduro and he drove it all by himself the whole nine hours and uh in a uh, racing craft boat at the time so in 1965 i was four years old and i remember you know every year uh my dad and family they would pack up everybody and we would head out to parker and stay at the Thunderbird Lodge out there right on the water and yeah. watch grandpa race. And and that happened for many, many years. You know, we're talking another, I don't know, almost 20 years after that, you know, he was running on that race. So that's kind of where it all started. I knew that there was something really cool. And, you know, he would drive up to, to the house in his uh, fancy Corvette that was, um, you know, redone or actually designed by George Barris. I don't know if you've seen pictures of that thing. It's actually have, a museum yes. now back east, uh, the Asteroid Corvette. But I remember he would pull up on our street and he'd give my brother and I rides in that thing. And it was just really awesome. And plus, he was at uh, drag racing that car on the um, San Fernando Valley drag strip, which we had out here in the valley, um, which is it's not here anymore. But I have old videos. You could see a lot of the old videos I've been posting. I created a Bob Nordskog YouTube page now. So if you want to go to YouTube type in Bob Nordskog um, page, you'll see I'm just little by little posting more of the family archives and old videos, you know, starting from the 60s up through the almost 1990 kind of thing. 
So yeah, my uh, voting yeah. thing kind of started early. Yeah, and those videos are really cool that you've been posting. They're so cool. It's it's yeah, pretty it's pretty awesome. pretty crazy how some how how old some of the how how old some of those videos are and the quality is pretty pretty darn good. Like you can see what's going on. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Is you know we had all these movies sitting around and um, uh, they weren't digitized yet. And I happened to meet a fella one day who we were just talking and he told me that he digitizes old movies and and I was just like let's do it. And I got a bunch for you. <laughs> I got a couple of those. To do it, you know, um, there's a lot there. Um, a lot of them don't have sound on them, unfortunately, you know, because they go way back in Super 8 and uh, 8 millimeter films. But there's a lot of cool stuff just to check out, you know, from the some of the early offshore racing from the mid 1960s. I think it has one of Grandpa's uh, very first races out in um, uh, right off uh, Long Beach where they went around Catalina. And um, and then the following years, uh, we get into the the boat, the Holocaust, which he he uh, he purchased. It was a 27 foot uh, uh, Thunderbird, and you'll see that boat in number 33. Um, that's actually the boat that's in the movie Run Sunward. I don't know if if you know our boating people. You should definitely check out Run Sunward. Um, Run Sunward. Um, was a movie that was done in the mid 60s it's probably what grandpa used to play this he had the actual real copy of this movie and he would bring it like on christmas or whatever and all his kids would sit around and he you know we'd always want to see the boating movies and he'd always pull up you know turn on his movie projector and we'd watch run sunward and he's actually in it in the boat number 33 and it's a really great boat has all the uh, or the uh, a lot of great footage has a lot of early uh offshore racers in that and it's very well done um you could actually see that that is on my on the youtube page i talked about run sunward um so check it out if you want to see like early offshore racing that is really well done the movie you know the quality is probably a little funky because it was transferred digitally you know it's an old movie but you can get the idea it's really great that's so cool because um i mentioned it with i can't remember one of my guests a while ago, but I, I watch a, uh, there's an automotive podcast, some guys that I know do. And they, one of the questions they ask every time is, uh, Hey, what's one of your favorite car movies? And then we kind of can't do that on boats because there's hardly any. So I've kind of started to making myself like a kind of a list and I've never heard of this one. So I'll have to check that out. Got to check out run sunward. Then, then there's also some really good yeah. footage that, uh, um, Paul cook put out with the Kama team with Betty cook. Um, that they did. And mm. I think that from the mid seventies and there's some video up there on the page showing that, and there's some really great footage of the Kama boat running. Uh, also my grandfather's 35 foot cigarette, um, a powerboat magazine special, the red, white, and blue boat, number 11, really terrific, uh, footage helicopter shots running out to Catalina and around Catalina. Also the old Benny Hanna boat, that. um, that Rocky wasn't driving at the time. And actually it was named spirit at the time um, with a different driver and whatever, but there's some really great footage, uh, Sandy Satulo and copper kettles running in that. So check out those videos. Those are really great shots. Awesome. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know about the YouTube channel. That's cool. I get, okay, cool. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll put a link to it when I do the show notes and the on sure. podcast too. So, um, yeah, I went back through. I looked. At, I've got the old tribute issue when your grandfather passed in in '92, I believe, and uh, I saw in there, which I didn't know too. I guess it's at one point uh, he got your you and your brother into some little outboards, right? You were doing the knee jockey stuff. Yeah, that was when I was about 14, 15 years old. Um, at the time, my grandfather was doing a lot of tunnel boat racing, and he hooked up with the great tunnel boat racer Ted May at the time. And Ted actually became one of my grandfather's, he actually ended up working for my grandfather and was one of the co-drivers over the years. But Ted was one of the greatest uh, tunnel boat racers of all time. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, he, he and Jimbo McConnell and people like that, you know, all kind of came from the same era. Um, so, and Ted initially used to run the little stock outboard boats. So what happened was Ted, um, told my grandfather that he wants to build a couple boats with us kids and get us out running. And my grandfather approved of the whole thing. And so the next thing you know, we've got actually three little hydros that were being built 
in the North, North Scott Competition Center uh, under the watchful eye of Norm Teague at the time, who was keeping an eye on everything. But uh, one boat was for my brother, one was for me, and the other one was for uh, Don Johnston. And Don, Don became one of the top tunnel boat racers in, the, I believe, in the 80s. He ran for the Arcadian team, Don. And um, so, yeah, we had a lot of fun with that for a couple of years, uh, probably about three or four years, actually. And uh, then, then myself, um, I ended up running uh, on the Alan Ishii team, running some of Alan's boats. Uh, Alan was one of the top Alki drivers at the time and an amazing, amazing guy. And uh, he had these, his boats were little pickle forks, actually more lighter weight than ours. Our boats were kind of built the way Ted built them back in the early days. So they were a little heavier than what was being ran at the time. So when we first started running our boats in the stock hydro and the A hydro class, we were a little bit slower than most everybody because it just our boats were kind of a little outdated. Once we put a little bit more power on the back of them, though, we started running the B hydro and the 25 SS class. Uh, that's when the boats actually started to take off and we start we were actually competitive. But when we ran it with the A hydro, we just weren't as competitive. So I was running Alan's little A hydro boat. And, um, well, I had a pretty nasty crash in the um, uh, Nationals one time up at Lake Ming, Bakersfield. Um, I was riding Alan's little boat, and we were heading into the first turn. And, you know, you start off a clock, and there was about 12 of us all going to the first turn. The guy in front of me, he kind of chimed his boat and started to flip on its side. And I was so close to him, behind him, that I basically speared him in the back with the pickle fork of uh. my boat, flew out of, out of the boat. Our boats were stuck together like this. The pickle fork was right through the bottom of his boat. I ended up in the water. Alan Ishii um, was actually riding in that race too in another boat. He jumped out to make sure I was okay, which I was. Um, we went around and uh, we brought the boat back in. Um, they fixed the sponsons of it. There's actually some pictures on my YouTube or my uh, Facebook page of this. And there's actually a photo in Powerboat Magazine in the 1977, I think it's October issue, showing us doing the repair on the on the right sponson. And so they duct taped it all up, fixed it. The guys who boat that I ran into, it was a brand new boat right through the bottom of it. That boat was done. The guy was pretty kind of upset but it's like hey you know you crashed in front of me what would what was it's i crazy, gonna do? Man. you know i ran into him at full speed practically uh but i went out the next heat and actually got second place so it was pretty cool um so that was probably my biggest crash that i ever had to where it was kind of nasty and but i survived and and uh you know as a young kid at 15 it was like i just bounced right back ready to go yeah 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 no <laughs> fear right yeah exactly yeah so yeah, that's that's cool. I didn't I didn't know you had rent, you had uh, raced those as, as much as you did. So that's cool. Two years and um, which was a lot of fun. And then what happened was um, when I became 18 years old. If you want to get into kind of how my offshore boat racing career happened, um, I was 18 years old, and my grandfather was doing the uh, prepping for the Canada to Mexico record run. And um, he actually attempted the run the first time and with his crew, the crew was Norm Teague as the mechanic, crew chief, and he had his longtime navigator with him, which was named Noel Younger. Uh, Noel um, worked for my grandfather for many years and was side by side with him through all the early years of racing. And uh, most of the early runs that you see with the 35 foot cigarette with the uh, red, white and blue boat, number 11, that's Noel in the boat as the navigator. Well, they did the very first attempt of the Canada to Mexico race in 1979. And this particular run, they were actually going to run f straight through. They had three stops, fuel stops coming down. But this time, okay. uh, the original run, they were going to run through the night. And um, what happened was, you know, they were coming down and I guess the water out there got so big and so scary and so intense and they had no aircraft support or anything at that time. Uh, they came in, they never finished the, the run. Uh, I think they broke a stern drive or something. Um, but when they came in, Noel Younger basically said, that's it. My offshore racing <laughs> is, is done. 
because it was it was pretty hairy out there from what I was told, you know, and heard the stories from Norm and everything. So what happened, Grandpa decided to do the the record again the following year. He didn't have an, anybody for the navigator seat. He looked at me because he knew that we were racing the little hydroplanes. And uh, my brother couldn't do it at the time. He was actually starting to uh, uh, train to be a, a sheriff's deputy out in Riverside County. So he was going through all the all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but Grandpa asked me to be the navigator. So I worked with Noel Younger quite a bit. And back in those days, too, you're not running off of uh, GPSs or anything. Um, you're, you know, setting charts with the courses. So we had the whole chart laid out coming from Canada all the way down to the Mexico. Uh, there's basically separation buoys at the top. There's a, a buoy right at the top of, um, you know, end of uh, California, between California and Canada, wow. actually. But on the uh, Mexico side, there's no buoy. So you just got to know, you know, got to get an idea of like your positions and whatever. And so what we did to navigate down was use our compass our time and a Loran situation, a Loran unit, which was kind of in a sense like the early GPS, but it would uh, only pinpoint you within a half a mile compared to GPS now pinpoints you within five feet or whatever now, you know, but you had a half a mile basically of variance there. And so grandpa asked me to do it. I said, I'll do it. This time we did not run at night. We basically, when we did the record attempt, it was a elapsed time. So we would, uh, you know, we started out of CQ Washington and uh, came up the uh, uh, through that the strait. I can't even think the name of it, but the strait out to the uh, California coast and separation buoy um, over there. And that's when the time started. And we just started heading down the coast. We had three different stops. We had a lot of big water coming down. Um, you know, it was a couple times when I was kind of like hanging on going, oh, man, this is pretty gnarly out here. But I always knew, you know, and I felt very comfortable and safe because I knew that Bob Nortskog was at the helm and he wouldn't do anything crazy to, you know, and I, I knew I'd always be safe. And then plus, you know, Norm Teague, one of the best crew chiefs around, you know, um, kept everything working properly. Um, but, yeah, it was pretty much a pretty radical attempt. And we ended up finishing it in 31 hours and 30 something seconds. I don't have the have the details right in front of me, but it was about a 31 hour run of elapsed time. Um, wow. You know, every time we stopped for fuel, you know, the clock stopped and then we would, right, you know, right. once we got out again, boom, you know, there's one kind of funny story of it coming down. Um, we were, I think it was out in the Northern California. There's a little cove called Shelter Cove up there, little sleepy little fishing village. And uh, we were coming down the coast and it was a, a significant fog up there and uh, we had actually airplane support that would kind of try to come over us but really you know over the uh, at this time when we were running there was just fog everywhere so they really couldn't see us most of the time and but anyway um we had to come in because the fog was just like you couldn't see like five feet in front of you right so we pulled into this sleepy little fi fishing village called shelter cove and there was just one road out of that village out to the uh out to the city out there, which was about, I don't know, an hour drive. And there was a little airport runway on the top there for little private airplanes to land. So what happened was our support aircraft landed, picked up my grandfather, took him out uh, to the hotel area because we knew we were going to be stuck overnight here. So he ends up taking off, heading out. And by the time the airplane came back, the fog sucked, uh, sucked in so bad that they couldn't land. So basically, I was spent the night uh, with Norm Teague and another fella called Wade uh, Worley. He was one of the uh, support guys that was involved with us down the, with my grandfather, actually became the president of the company at one point. But uh, we ended up spending the night in a little abandoned camper shell overnight, you know, <laughs> that we had to find because there was no hotel. There's no nothing. We're just in a little, <laughs> tiny little village and just nothing, you know, and yeah. uh and I just remember, you know, we we're trying to find a place to sleep and we we're just kind of walking around. And there was this old abandoned camper shell. We end up going inside and I ended up laying down and Norm Teague and Wade, you know, there was a little they had a, um, a fish and bait shop there that had kind of, you know, beer and things, too. You could buy little snacks and stuff. So we grabbed some snacks and, 
and Norm and them grabbed a couple six packs of beer. So they sat there up all night drinking their six packs. And, you know, I was an 18 year old kid. They gave me a couple sips, but I was, I was too tired. So I ended up just sleeping through the night, but that was kind of an interesting night sleeping in an old abandoned camper shell out at Shelton <laughs> Cove. And then the next day, sure, yeah, sure enough, the fog lifts, grandpa comes flying back in. And the, <laughs> the boss comes back. <laughs> yeah, he comes back, you know, he had a good night's sleep, boom, boom, gets in the boat, they all pick <laughs> up and go. But, you know, that was just really kind of a, something I'll never forget was that night at Shelton yeah. Cove with Norm Teague, yeah. you know, cracking jokes all night. So it was, that was just something <laughs> fun. So anyway, uh, that's it's a good awesome. story. Yeah, that's awesome. That that's that's just um, had to be an amazing experience. What so what did so when Grandpa says, "Hey, I, I want you in the boat." What your mom and dad were they, they they cool with it? They just used to that's just your dad was like, "Oh, that's what dad does," right? Yeah, no, they were okay with it. Um, you know, again, everybody knew it's Bob Nordskog. He's got more uh, experience than just about anybody at the at that time, and so they were totally cool with it. Um, after we ran the uh, 39 foot scare or 39 foot cigarette, which was the distance boat run, the cam boat, if I see pictures of it, uh, that's yellow a cam boat, okay, the cam boat, right? Yeah, that's the boat that we set up with extra fuel tanks and everything, and had all the navigation systems set up, and it was kind of set up for distance runs. Grandpa ran that boat as the uh, uh, the San Francisco to L.A., San Francisco to uh, Long Beach record, as well. And uh, he also ran that boat in the Sea of Cortez down here in Mexico um, and set the world's record down there as well. Um, after that boat kind of retired, though, that's when he ended up going into the uh, 38 Scarab boat that he purchased. And that was that became his race boat was a 38 and ran that in probably 1982 to 85, which I was still lucky enough to get in the boat with Grandpa at that time as a navigator. So I had about three seasons of of that boat. And then about 1985, um, Bob Teague ended up jumping into the navigator's seat with his brother Norm with Grandpa. So it ended up the two Teague brothers with Bob Nordskog. And then Bob, my grandfather, was kind enough to let my brother and I run for about three seasons, uh, his 27-foot Magnum with uh, twin Johnsons on the back. And we ran that in, in the... Uh, uh, the other class, you know, the lower class is out here and a lot of the Popra MBRA races locally. And we went up to San Francisco and ran and did the Vegas race and things like that. So we ran that for about three seasons. And uh, once that was done, um, we were pretty much uh, done. What happened was a, uh, there was a hole that started to uh, create on the bottom of that boat and it kind of got a little dangerous as the hole was getting bigger, you know, and it's just like we had to retire the boat. And after that, uh, Grandpa was talking about putting my brother and I in a skater at the time. And we were, you know, we were actually all jazzed about that. It's when the skaters were starting to be hot and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. thinking that would be fun to, you know, start running the skaters and whatever. But that never happened. And Grandpa ended up um, uh, kind of retiring the 38 Scarab, uh, ended up getting into the, uh, the 40 foot fountain, um, you know, mm. which was very first fountain race boat that Reggie made, um, which was his, you know, for specifically for grandpa, the very first race boat was the 40 fountain. Oh, wow. Uh, which, which now that that fountain is actually sitting out at uh, outside at the uh, Teague Custom Marine up in Valencia out here in California. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The boat is still out and about. Uh, the 38 foot scarab, by the way, I've been speaking with a fella recently who's asking me for old memorabilia and things. He's um, the boat was uh, purchased a few many years ago and it was repainted and uh, white and ran in some other classes or whatever. But this fella now out of um, uh, the Florida area purchased the boat. He has it now and he's going to bring it back to life with the old look, how it looked when grandpa ran it. Which all the old really graphics. Yeah. So he's going to put all the old graphics on it. Powerball oh, magazine sweet. number 11, bring back the same color scheme. Um, there's a lot of that going on now. I don't know if you've seen that out there. Um, you know, there's a fella out in Europe, uh, Christian Toll, who took the old uh, Kema boat. It's actually a copy of the Kema boat, but he mm -hmm. also has the original um, uh, Don Arano boat, Kikafer boat, that he he wow. restored. And it looks, you know, brand new. Um, he's got the dry martini boat. And so he's got the three different boats that look just like they did back in the early days. And uh, I just think that's great that people are doing that. 
kind of keeping the history alive of that sort of mm-hmm. thing. So mm-hmm. Look for that scarab in a, you know, a couple years, um, coming back as the old Powerboat magazine special. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, that's the nostalgia stuff. I mean, obviously in cars, it's big, but yeah, boats, it's, it's gotten really big. Um, flat bottom, a lot of flat bottom guys are storing stuff and old race boats. And it's really, really cool. Where's, uh, where's the Viking spirit? What's, do do you guys still own that or where's that at? Do you know? Yeah. The Viking spirit, um, in 1997, uh, my grandfather was inducted into the motorsports hall of fame, the motorsports hall of fame. It initially was in Novi, Michigan. Well, about, I don't know, 10, maybe 15 years ago, maybe not that, yeah, maybe 15 years ago, it was moved actually to a new location. The new location is at the Daytona Motor Speedway, which is really great. So it's right at the speedway there. As soon as you walk in the main doors of the speedway, they got the Hall of Fame set up. And as you walk in, you see Viking Spirit on display. It's it's like flying out of the water like this. Oh, awesome. And... And just uh, about eight years ago, I I had Grandpa's old patch jacket. A lot of people will remember the patch jacket that he had. Uh, every single patch was hand sewn by my grandmother over the years of all the different races and events that he was involved with. Started out with one patch, and by the end of the the whole thing, both the the front, the back, and the arms, and even now inside the inside the the uh, jacket were patches just covering and a lot of them were just overlapping each other. It's just beautiful. It's just like all just patches. And um, we actually donated that patch jacket to the Motorsports Hall of Fame. So it's on display with Viking Spirit sitting there, um, as well as some trophies and and things at the Hall of Fame. So if you ever get out to the Daytona Motor Speedway, go to the Hall of Fame there. You can't miss Viking Spirit. It's it's like right there and it's beautiful. It's a 19 foot... um, uh, Nordskog Hall that my grandfather designed. Uh, they only made about 15 of them of those particular boats at the time. And um, but this boat is a beauty. It's a bl- blue metal flake, and that's the boat that you actually see in that movie. There's an Elvis movie called Clam Bake. If anybody sees the old movie Clam Bake, where Elvis is actually a boat racer, it's really funny. And they do these races out. Uh, there's a race. Um, it's the Miami Orange Bowl race, and uh, where Elvis is actually racing and Elvis is actually racing the boat uh, called Rawhide. Rawhide mm-hmm. was, uh, was run by Lou Brummett who ended up uh, starting the Mandela boats. And Lou Brummett was a good friend of grandpa's and they used to race all over the place together. Uh, and uh, so if you look at that movie, you'll actually see Elvis driving the Rawhide boat. And then there's the quick shot of grandpa running in Viking spirit in the movie, really good shot of him zipping through. And actually during that particular race, even though uh, Elvis wins that race, well, actually Bob Nordskog won that race. We have the trophy, (laughs) but um, it's kind of funny to see the old Elvis movie with all that. And, and just to touch a a quick note on the rawhide boat, which was owned by Lou Brummett, Uh, Lou Brummett um, was a good friend of grandpa's, he ran in Parker. He actually won the Parker race himself in that boat. Rawhide was an amazing competitor. Well, he, he died actually racing his boat by a neck injury, he broke his neck. And, um, it was very hard on my grandfather at the time. And my grandfather was seeing other boat racers having this neck injuries from being thrown out of the, the boats. And what happens is when they land in, on the water, uh, the regular size motor type, motorcycle type helmets have that extra thick padding and that thick padding was catching and bucketing onto the water. And with the chin strap, it was snapping their necks and people were having neck injuries. So that's when my grandfather uh, developed. I have one right here. That's uh, awesome. A non-bucketing helmet. And this actually was grandpa's helmet right here. And you could see in the non-bucketing helmet that there's no padding inside. And th- these helmets were actually made specifically to fit the individual's head. So basically inside here is a perfect shape of my grandfather's head. He had a very small head um, <laughs> because it's a very small helmet. But uh, you can see that when you wear these helmets, that it fits so 
tightly around the face and around up on top and around the back that when you do get ejected out of the boat, there's there's no there's nowhere for the water to go. It just kind of yeah. it runs can't off catch, the back yeah. or whatever, and it doesn't catch, right? Yeah. So he developed this helmet for that. He tried to get APBA for many years. Uh, Grandpa actually got the patent on it in 1974, I think, and um, uh, tried to get the APBA to allow other racers to use this helmet, which was a big problem at the time. And the big um, the big thing was that it wasn't Snell officially Snell approved, and the Snell. If you see an old old helmet, it says Snell approved, right? An old motorcycle mm -hmm. helmet, or whatever. I think I think I think Snell's still the still the uh, certification. Still the yeah, the Snell is like an impact, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so what happened? These helmets weren't officially Snell approved at the time, and but you know, Grandpa argued on the other side that well, in boating inju injuries, yeah. we're not landing on pavement or curbs or anything like a motorcycle or a car accident would type of deal. And most of the injuries are from people breaking their necks from the water, you know, scooping underneath there. And that was his argument. So what happened um, eventually was that uh, the APBA gave my grandfather a special waiver to wear the helmet. He had to basically sign like, you know, a liability thing mm -hmm. saying he's not going to, mm -hmm. you know, hold APBA liable for this, that, or the other, you know, if he right. died or anything. Um, but you know, he was allowed to wear the helmet. I actually wore one. I had one made for me and, uh, Ted May, that tunnel boat driver was wearing one, but, um, I heard that there's, um, discussions of, uh, these days of bringing this helmet back. Um, I don't want to give away the name of who's doing it. Maybe I don't know if he wants me to or not, but he's actually, um, runs an offshore boat and, uh, it's not one of the capsulized boats either. It's one that, you know, they're out there exposed. When they're going to go in the water. If they, yeah. When, when they're going to flip and they're going to go in the water. And you could see the helmets that they wear. Everybody's wearing the full face style helmet too, which were actually the worst type of helmet to wear. Um, the full face type helmet, because not only do you catch the bucketing from the back, you get the bucketing on the front of the neck too, right? To where if you did, didn't have the full face, you're not going to get the, the fronting bucketing as well. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, I would recommend anybody who's racing out there these days in that type of boat, you know, stay away from the full face. I mean, they look cool and this, that, and the other, but, um, you know, for safety reasons, you know, and, um, you know, um, you know, don't hold me liable on this, but that's what I would, I would do, you know, if I was running again, I would try to wear this type of helmet myself if I was, exposed you know without a safety capsule kind of cockpit um again there uh, there's a fella who's trying to campaign this whole thing again to bring it back um so we'll see where all that goes but anyway that's the non-bucketing yeah. helmet which tied into the lou brummett story and uh, tied into the elvis story which tied into the viking <laughs> story. oh so, that's no okay. thank, thanks for bringing it up because because I, I remember he did something with that but i didn't really know the the whole story of it so that's very cool and and you know i was i was water ski racing for years and we use that kind of helmet in fact i can't remember who made them but i remember they fit my hat my head and made it like that and and so but yeah when you're boat racing i mean there's there's no there's not going to be a perfect helmet i mean to make it slim and streamlined so you know the thing doesn't bucket yeah you're going to probably take away a little bit of the impact so um yeah, it's kind of where where you think the biggest risk is, and obviously, uh, if Bob thought it was there, then he he was probably the best one to know. That was probably the best way to go. So, what else was nice about it too, though, is when when you wear the helmet, it's not as heavy as the other helmets. So when you're oh. racing and you got the wind blowing against you, you know, you at the end of the race, your neck is all sore, you know, because you just all that wind resistance these things are lightweight and it's just like you know it's just it's like wearing nothing on your head practically so you don't get that feeling as well but anyway that's the non-bucketing helmet happen to have it right here just in case we talked about it uh, that's cool no we everybody listen to this thing we love all that stuff you know there's not a i mean the the one place uh 
probably the one place that has documented the history the most, or not the only place, but probably that documented the best was Powerboat Magazine. And um, I see you, you've got a bunch and you've, I've obviously collected some for years. I still buy them on eBay when I can catch them, but man, you read through those things and there's just so much history. It's so cool. So um, it's, it's, it's really cool that you're kind of being the guardian of that stuff now and letting people know about it. And thanks for doing that. So yeah, love I to hear about all it. The whole so. magazines here, um, just, you know, piles of them. And there's been people who've contacted me that are missing like certain issues or whatever. And, do you have this issue or that issue? And it's like, okay. And then we kind of work out an arrangement, but um, I'm glad that there's people still want to collect, you know, the, the magazines. There was a time when a lot of this stuff almost got tossed in the trash and I had to rescue a lot of the old files and history. My brother also saved a lot of my grandfather's, you know, archives and stuff and then ended up in boxes and we just saved it over all these years. You know, it was 92 when he passed away. So it's been quite a while now. And uh, so I'm glad that we were able to save a lot of this stuff because there is a lot of people interested in all the old history. And and again, like you said, with the old Powerboat magazines, there's so many cool and great articles going way back, you know, not not just on the racing, but, you know, all the different boat tests and, and things that, uh, you know, Bob did, you know, with his test team over the years, you know, which made the boats a lot safer um you know as you as you know um with power boat when grandpa would do a specific test uh for a boat he actually if he found something wrong with the boat that was a safety issue um on the bottom design or whatever it is when he was running it that he would give the manufacturer the option that okay you either fix the problem and i retest it or i'm going to print it in the magazine you make the choice <laughs> Well, every one of the manufacturers didn't want it printed in the magazine that this was their particular boat was unsafe. So they'd go back in and rework the mold or whatever and fix the problem. So over time, you know, the boats became safer and safer. And, uh, you know, thanks to, to Bob on uh, all this stuff, you know, and his integrity and um, and, the you know, the fact that he would give the opportunity to the manufacturer to fix the problem and they all did they all did which made everything safer well, for all of us yeah i i specifically remember though uh at some point reading it i think and they're not around anymore so they can't get mad at me but i think it was a campbell day cruiser and i think it was like one of the first ones they put a stern drive in it and it was horrible and the review was horrible and he's and i remember him writing in the review we tried to get him to fix it and they didn't want to fix it. So we're just going to let you know. And I distinctly remember reading that. That was probably in the seventies, but so yeah, he, he carried a big stick then. So, which was good. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it made it safer for, you know, everybody, you know, for the future, the public, you know, out there just jumping in one of these boats, you know, so um, really uh, give him kudos. The, what, the advantage for Bob too was Bob was a very successful businessman and so he didn't need to he didn't need the advertising of the magazine to live off of so he wasn't worried about pissing off an advertiser where you know in the later years you, were, you had to live off advertising so you had to kind of tiptoe a little bit but uh yeah that was that was definitely an advantage he had yeah no you're you're absolutely right on that uh, you know my grandfather actually started his business north scout company in 1951 which were he became the largest in the uh, manufacturer of aircraft galleys and, and ground support equipment for many, many years. Uh, that's kind of um, he, he where he came out of. My grandfather actually worked at Lockheed and then ended up working directly with Howard Hughes. And uh, my grandfather worked on the uh, did all the electrical and stuff on the Spruce Goose uh, aircraft. So he worked directly with Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes started uh, was involved with TWA, Trans World Airlines, at the beginning. And uh, they contacted my grandfather, said, we need galleys and kitchens and blah, blah, blah. Can you make them? And my grandfather was an expert of, you know, with sheet metal and that kind of thing at the time and designing these things. So he started Nordskog Company in 1951, uh, designing and building all the aircraft galleys, uh, um, as well as, you know, the co first coffee maker was, uh, you know, we had the patent for the very first microwave ovens and ovens and all that that we built on on board. So if you're ever on an early aircraft and then you can still see them actually out there now on older aircraft, uh, some Nordskog galleys, but you were probably served, you know, from a Nordskog galley 
So hopefully your coffee was hot and your food was hot at the time. And you could actually see a Nordskog galley. They have them on, um, if you ever get out to Simi Valley out here in California at the uh, Ronald Reagan uh, Presidential Library, uh, there's Air Force One is in there. And you walk in Air Force One, you get a little tour, you can walk right through the aircraft and you look over to the left and, and there's a Nordskog. It actually still has our placard on there, Nordskog Company. And so all the galleys in the aircraft of uh, Air Force One are on display at the Reagan Library, which is really awesome to see. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I, I was reading because I, I knew about the, the galley thing, but I guess he had uh, kind of had like his own shop where he was repairing planes and fixing planes and doing stuff with planes when that all started, which I didn't know. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, his first uh, repair, Amelia Earhart's old cracked up airplane that she crashed. He actually re repaired her old uh, airplane. Oh, wow. So he was on, involved with that as well as involved with the Constellation aircraft, which is a beautiful airplane. Uh, as as people in the industry call it, the Connie. Um, I actually still have one of Grandpa's original manuals for the Constellation. It's about this thick. Uh, it's just it's amazing and it's really awesome to look through. But uh, yeah, that's kind of where he, you know, got all his uh, his skills and kind of turned it into the uh, aircraft galley to business. And then his love for racing and boating, he decided to buy. Um, uh, it was actually Hot Boat at the time. They called it Hot Boat Magazine in 1964. Okay, I was going to ask you that. Okay. Yeah, it was okay. 1964. And uh, so he turned it. There's an, uh, an actual issue, and I think it's 1966 or 65 issue, where it's combined. It says Hot Boat and Power Boat on the same cover, where they kind of do the switcheroo. And I have some copies here of that, which is kind of neat. And so that's kind of where Power Boat started. And then he had the little office uh, powerboat building, which was um, sitting right next to the competition center out here in Van Nuys, California, all those years um, where they did all the early, um, you know, issues of Powerboat magazine until, you know, again, as you probably know, after grandpa died in 92, um, my dad ended up taking over the Powerboat magazine. And uh, it was my dad moved the magazine up to the Ventura area. And uh, that's, you know, so all the later issues from 19, like 95, 1994 on up into the mid 2000s, somewhere around there, um, were all done up in uh, Ventura with a terrific team of people as well as he had. You know, uh, it was a great magazine, won a lot of awards and, you know, just a terrific magazine, great crew of people. and. Yeah, the the, hit, the history of the people that have worked there. I mean, I still talk to Bob Brown, who was an editor for years. But the history, I mean, just 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 a great group of people through the years. Obviously, you talk about Bob and and Norm Teague, and and uh, just yeah, all the way through through the end. Even the guys in the end, uh, Jason and Brett Becker, and uh, they were good guys too. Um, yeah. And then I know it. I, I can't remember exactly. I don't know if, if it got sold a couple times, but I know at some point he sold the magazine. Uh, to Bonnier or I can't remember who it was. Yeah, my dad ended up uh, wanting to move on at the time. So he sold the magazine. I think it was in 2008 or somewhere, maybe. I, don't, I okay. can't remember. Um, and they moved it back east, somewhere to Florida. And I um, can't remember who the group, of, group was that purchased the magazine, but they had other magazines, other titles, you know, uh, to work with. And uh, so it was a good buy for them. Um, I think now there's no Powerboat magazine anymore. I think it ended up kind of turning into Speedboat, I think, or Speed on the Water, I think. I think, is that? Jason, uh, Jason Johnson and, and um, Matt Trulio. Obviously, Matt was a longtime rider at Powerboat. They have Speed on the Water. It's their own, it's their own deal. But um, I think they were, I think Jason was the editor when it was sold. And I know it went to Bonnier. There was another one, Ellert Company. But at some point, it was a horrible time for print media. It was starting to really get get bad, and and so they just ended up folding it. And so, but what's really good about that whole thing is that I, I'm so glad that you've been able to salvage as much as you have because I I remember uh, when that was all happening. Like man, even to this day, I'm like, wow, where is all that stuff? Because there was so much history there, and it was just so you know because they were a big corporation that bought it. And it was like man, I hope that stuff just didn't all go into the trash. Yeah, we kept a lot of things and, um, you know, a lot of things did has, has been dispersed over the years. Things of my grandfather's, too. Um, you know, we, we had all his trophies and 
from his trophy room and all that and awards and little by little, you know, I mean, it's been night since 92 and, and you kind of down, start to downsize, downsize, move locations and had sure. everything in boxes. And just really actually in the last couple of years, when my father moved, had to move out of his uh, uh, facility that he was at. Now he's kind of working out of his house as he's getting older. Um, we, I, I was personally went up there and started to go through every box again and made sure do not throw this out, save this, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And then what happened was a lot of the trophies got dispersed to different family members. Um, you know, certain family members got this, that, and the other. And other things are still boxed up in the storage, you know. Um, some ended up in museums. Some some ended up in a few private collections with people out there that really want some of this stuff. And uh, so that's kind of what's happened. A little bit's kind of gone here, a little there. Wish we could have kind of kept it all together, but it's just um, as time goes by, it's just, it's kind of what happens. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard, you know, with your kids' trophies and all that stuff. You know, at some point you're like, I just, I just don't have room to, to keep doing it. But again, it's good. It's good. You're and you're taking photos of a lot of the stuff. So even if you don't have it, people can see pictures of it, which is, which is really cool. I mean, I, I love seeing it. So I'm sure a lot of other people out there do. So keep, keep that up. One thing that uh, when I was reading, just refreshing my memory about stuff your grandfather did, was amazing to me was that so he died when he was seventy nine. Um, but three weeks before he died, he won his last offshore race. So at 79, he, he ran an offshore race in Marina del Rey, I believe. And, uh, you know, in, in the fountain probably. And, uh, that's pretty amazing. The guy at his age was, was still doing that. Yeah. The fountain itself, if you look at the number on the side of the boat, which is number 75. So he, he purchased himself a 75th birthday present, which was the fountain power boat. So that's where 75 came from. And he ran it for basically four seasons until he passed away. And like you said, it was just a few weeks before he um, he had a stroke, really. And um, it's really sad. It kind of ha happened so fast within the family. Um, but, um, you know, he was the Iron Man out there. Um, nobody could do it better at the time, uh, you know, and had more knowledge and skill. I mean, there was a lot of different racers, you know, people half his age would run against him and couldn't believe the stamina that grandpa had out there. And he had some great people, you know, uh, running with him all those years. Again, the t both Teague brothers, Bob and Norm, um, I'm glad that we're there, um, you know, could help him tremendously, especially in his lat you know, later years, um, you know, as he got older, uh, that they were both there to help him and support him in the boat. But um, yeah, just a few weeks before he passed away, there's an iconic photo that that's in one of the um, uh, it, uh, issues of Powerboat. I think it's in the in the uh, tribute issue of his, to where it shows him just kind of walking away with a checkered flag that he's holding. It's uh, kind of a back shot with him in the race uniform. That's the last picture that was taken of him, and uh, right after that race, so. Um, yeah, it was kind of a sad day for everybody and when he passed away and it was a lot to deal with with the family. Um, you know, my grandmother basically decided that, you know, she had all these years of boat racing and things like that. My brother and I basically begged her to hang on to the all of this stuff and hang on to the race boats. <laughs> Maybe we yeah, can yeah. race them, you know. And she just says, well, who's going to pay for it? You know, <laughs> I'm not going to pay for this. <laughs> So she decided, uh, you know, that it was grandpa's thing and she didn't want us kids or grandsons to get killed in a boat or something. And she didn't want to be the ones that's paying for us to get killed in a boat or whatever. So she basically wanted everything gone. So pretty much immediately we um, started to sell the offshore boats, um, you know, first. Uh, and then we, little by little, you know, some of the other things that were kind of just sold piece by piece over the years. Um, again, that, you know, the Corvette has ended up in a museum. Um, he had the KT, the ET boat that recently was sold about a year or so ago. It was a fella up in Washington area, the Washington state that actually has the old ET boat. And um, uh, Viking Spirit ended up in the Motorsports Hall of Fame. And, um, 
you know, uh, the number 11 boat we're still looking for, uh, the 35 cigarette. What happened with that, and what's interesting about that boat, you know, that was the first 35 cigarette made. My grandfather actually set the world's record in that boat at 90 miles an hour at the time. Um, he actually added some, extended the strakes on the bottom of the boat another two feet all the way to the edge of the transom, which gave the boat more lift and more speed. Uh, the original boat didn't have that. But um, that particular boat, when he was running it, I think the last race that he ran it was up in San Francisco and coming under the Golden Gate Bridge outside of the Potato Patch area, they call it. Very rough water up there. That boat, boat came off a big roller and landed and put a big crack on the bottom of the hull. So that's when put the end to that particular boat. But that boat ended up just sitting in the competition center all these years on display. And uh, a fella came by uh, who knew that he wasn't going to race the boat anymore. There was no engines in it or anything at the time. They wanted to, uh, they were building or involved with a, uh, a restaurant. They were going to build this uh, restaurant called the Hot Boat Cafe and out in Las Vegas area. And they wanted the boat to where the boat would be on display inside the restaurant, right? amongst all these other boats and boating paraphernalia and is that the word paraphernalia, <laughs> but um, boating items or whatever. Yeah, you got and, um, and so I guess the, the restaurant never happened. They couldn't get all the funding and whatever for it. And somehow the boat just disappeared off the face of the earth. And I've had a lot of people I've asked. So if anybody knows where that particular 35 foot cigarette is, Get in touch with me, get in touch with Joe or whoever to get in touch with me. We're just kind of looking for it because there's people that would love to restore that thing and get it back to its old glory. Because, again, it's a one of a kind, very unique boat and has a lot of history behind it. But we just don't know what happened to it. It just kind of disappeared off the face of the earth. And I hope it didn't end up in a landfill or anything like that. Yeah, no kidding. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, I, I just I recently listened to a. Uh, the, sp the speedboat guys have a podcast and they had Bob Teague on there and Bob just talked about Bob talked about uh, Bob Norsgaard quite a bit and just really gives him the credit for everything he's done and um, so yeah Bob and Norm were there for for Bob in the end but obviously Bob helped those guys really get into the marine industry and become who they are which they're still doing it today you know so that was pretty cool and I'm sure there's a lot of people that 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 Bob Norsgaard helped help make their way into this industry you know, the Teague Customerine ended up, uh, my grandmother was very fond of the Teagues and very fond, you know, Norm, when he started working, he was just a, like a teenager, I think, you know, pretty much. So he's really? been with Grandpa all these years, but um, Bob Teague, you know, was there for many, many years. I know Bob was a fireman, fire captain and all that. And then he had his own little uh, business where he was actually running his GN boats and stuff. And, and he created Teague Customerine and after uh, Grandpa died, uh, Grandma, again, was very fond of Bob and, and all that and wanted to help him in his business. So she basically took the North Scott Competition Center, which we started to clear out of all the boats and stuff, and we split it in half, put a big fence up in the middle of it. It was a 10,000-square-foot building in Van Nuys. So we put a big fence in the middle to where on one side had had some of the leftovers of Grandpa's things minus the big boats that were gone but all the other stuff is where i actually was running this uh, north scog speedometer business out of at the time and then on the other side uh, t custom marine kind of rolled into the other side in the van nuys building and grandma did a nice deal for bob teague at the time and a lot of the equipment and the engine building equipment and machines and the you know all of this stuff ended up uh, she did a great deal with Bob. I don't remember the whole exact details, but he ended up with a lot of the North Scott Competition Center uh, things and uh, machinery, whatever, which helped really helped him get his business going. And then, you know, as we all know, Bob, um, Grandma also, you know, because Grandpa did the um, the boat testing all these years. And after he died, died, Powerboat Magazine needed a new boat tester. Um, to where, so grandma, you know, basically tagged Bob Teague as the, uh, you know, I want you to be the number one boat tester here. So that's kind of how Bob ended up doing all the testing for, for Powerboat Magazine all those years. And, um, 
you know, with Norm doing his own thing, you know, Norm was just building engines. Like Norm was probably one of the best engine builders around. Really amazing, very meticulous guy. Um, and uh, I, I believe Norm still works for Bob up there, um, you know, building some motors up in, out in Valencia. But uh, so Team Custom Marine did, did have some help with uh, from my grandfather, my grandmother, and uh, and my and continued with my father by keeping him on as the you know the head boat tester at Powerboat Magazine, and now he's got a terrific business up there going, and you know one of the premier names in um, in boating. And, and I'll tell you, um, I saw a uh, been to a few of the Powerboat uh, test sessions through the years, and and Bob took Bob Teague. I mean, he he took. He stepped in right where your right where your grandfather left off because he was meticulous, man. He had his three or four pages of checklists and like you didn't miss a thing. And and uh, he, he definitely he definitely uh, saw what your what your grandfather did as a, a a big value and he took it seriously. And I think he still does. So I think he's doing it for speedboat now, but I think he did it for powerboat till the till the very end. So yeah, yeah, pretty good. Yes, did. Yeah, no, we're we're grateful to Bob on you know taking the reins of that and. Um, you know, and kept, you know, the integrity and the, and, you know, the quality of the magazine and the boat test, you know, just like grandpa would have, would have wanted it. So definitely happy about that. Yeah. Great story. So it's probably, it's probably hard because you have a ton of memories, but what's, what's your fondest memory of being in a boat, whether just by yourself with your grandfather, which, what's your kind of like the coolest thing you remember? Um, I think, again, I think the coolest thing for me was my first induction was that Canada to Mexico deal, just because I got to spend a lot of time with him and, you know, just on, on all the preparation of getting ready for the, you know, for the race, um, and just coming down the coast that many miles down the coast with him. I mean, again, I ran in the Scarab for a few seasons, but that was just running around, you know, local races and San Francisco and, you know, around Catalina and things like that. But, you know, I got to really see, you know, the amazing man that grandpa was, you know, he also put on That's that, awesome. that spruce goose chase that we know um, where he put all, got all the manufacturers together. Um, and he did a special race from San Francisco down to Long Beach so they called it the Golden Gate to Spruce Goose Chase. And he had all the premier drivers at the time, Sandy Satulu, Betty Cook, you know, my grandfather. Or actually, uh, my grandfather didn't race in it. He was just kind of the figurehead. And But, um, you know, we got the top manufacturers at the time to actually do a run all the way down, which was really, really an amazing deal. Um, but, yeah, I think, you know, if, when I look back, uh, you know, Grandpa was always there for us kids, us grandkids, um, which was, you know, anytime I needed him for anything, you know, on a Saturday, he would say, meet me down at the shop, right? And if we had a car problem or something, you know, when I was just a teenager or whatever, oh, my, you know, I had a VW van at the time, you know, but I put my surfboards in, but, you know, I'd have a problem or of something. Of course like you did. That, you know, so <laughs> he's like, uh, bring it on down. Let me, let me drive it, you know, and you know, he would diagnose the problem pretty quickly. And then, you know, he would let his, he had mechanics over there at the time. We had a, uh, our own mechanics that, uh, you know, the shop mechanics who worked on all his um, company vehicles would, would help us out. But grandpa would diagnose everything. And probably one of the coolest things though, that he did when I was actually even younger, I was, a, when I was riding my bicycles just around, I used to race like BMX motocross kind of thing. And, uh -huh. and, um, uh, my friend and I wanted to build a side hack bicycle, right? And like you see a motorcycle, okay. right? A little side sure. hack, right? And so basically, we I, I still have the drawing around here, right? And and I found it years later. It was in my grandfather's desk after he passed away. I was digging through all his stuff, found our original drawing of the side hack that he saved all these years. He thought it was so cool. You know, we had a picture, a drawing of a bicycle, and then the you know, of how the side hack would be attached with a little basket and, you know, where the other person would sit in there and hang on. And, and, uh, he, he just thought that was so amazing that he's all, yeah, meet me down at the shop. Well, you know, I go down to the shop and next thing you know, he's putting his welding torch, you know, oh, my gosh. On, 
He's cutting the uh, the other bike up in half, welding the, the tubes together to bring the two bikes together, putting everything, you know, I, I just couldn't even believe it. And by the time, you know, a couple hours later, we had this awesome side hack that my friend and I used to just ride around oh my God. You know, locally just for fun, you know, it was just a gas, but he would do just, you know, crazy things like that for us. And I was very grateful, you know, to him that he always spent the time for us kids that anytime we needed him for anything, you know, he helped me a lot initially when I was doing my Z-Bug business. The Z-Bug's a little container that I had patented that you can stick on a watch band or your sunglass or whatever. And the little container was so you could put your sunscreen in it when you're out surfing or out hiking or whatever, just make it easy access. And I got a patent for that years ago. And and grandpa was so proud of me when I got the the initial patent now, you know, and um, he really helped us with just with a lot of, you know, little just crazy things like that over the years. So I'm very grateful to him for, you know, for letting me, you know, run in the race boat with him for being there when he, you know, when I needed a, my side hack built, being there when we were able to build our little 10 foot hydros, you know, he, and he paid, always paid for all this stuff. You know, all the free gas and our entry fees and the travel and, you know, all that. Wow. You know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And it was just, um, he was just really an amazing man, had a good heart, very smart, um, very caring and, and loving person. You know, his employees absolutely adored him. The the shop many times, he had, at one point he had 2,000 employees working for him. And, and wow. there were times when the, they tried to unionize uh, the employees, you know, and, um, you know, where union people came in and tried to organize a union. And every single time it was voted down because grandpa took care of them so well. Um, he paid everybody really good, um, a fair wage. Every Christmas, everybody got an extra check and a free turkey and a box of seized candy, you know, which um, every employee got. And, uh, you know, he did a lot of you know, nice things. He helped a lot of people in a lot of ways, you know, um, personally. So, um, a, a terrific guy. I miss him a lot. And, um, I do miss the times together. That's awesome. And yeah, uh, and I got to tell you, going back to the, to the Canada, Mexico, Canada, the Mexico thing. I mean, I, I can't imagine the navigation chores, you know, big water, uh, you know, when you're 18 years old, I mean, it, it's, that's a pretty big achievement for you, man, to be able to do that and handle it. And, and, uh, so obviously he saw that you could do it or he, or he figured out that you would figure it out. And, uh, so good for you. That's, that's, that's an amazing, amazing thing that, that a kid your age got to do, but uh, good job for, for handling it and doing it. That's, that's awesome. Uh, you'll see the actual initial test. We had the news crew down from local channel seven, ABC news crew with Ted Dawson uh, was doing a story on grandpa oh and that. So if you go to the YouTube channel again, uh, you'll see the cam okay, test. Cool. Yeah, see cam test and uh, you'll see me as an 18 year old kid and with Norm and, and grandpa and we're doing an, our first run. And I actually have a headset on where I was communicating with the uh, aircraft up above and kind of just getting the feel for the, uh, the Loran uh, unit. And, and uh, they filmed it, you know, uh, uh, for the uh, local news. And um, so, yeah, that's on the YouTube channel. There was another time, I, I don't have it, but um, ABC was out there filming Grandpa one time for one of his, uh, you know, because he was always on the news, you know, local hero out here. And he was out running his boat and the boat came up and chimed down and Grandpa flew out and they got it live on TV, <laughs> which was pretty amazing, you know. Um, and it kind of went, as we would say, viral these days, you know. Yeah. Um, it went do, do you have that? Do you have that? Or is... I don't have that clip, do you... but it's, I know it's no. there somewhere. Okay. I've got to find it. it but uh, there is a, a clip somewhere of that. But, you know, you could see him actually being pulled in by the rope. And, you know, is you know, anyway, he flew out of the boat. And, yeah. But they yeah. got it. You know, got the whole crap <laughs> on, uh, on tape. You know, I don't know yeah. if a lot Press of people conf... know, too, the, the big story of him with the Hennessy, Hennessy Cup. Uh, do you want me to tell that story? That's an interesting sure, story. Sure, sure. The Hennessy um, uh, story was back in the early 60s, you know, they had the Bahamas 500 race out there. And Grandpa went out to the Bahamas 500 race and was running somebody else's boat. It wasn't his boat at the time. And I guess it was some old aluminum boat. 
And uh, he had a, the other crew member, uh, the navigator guy, was some local guy that they he got because he apparently knew the locate all the islands and all the different ways you know around here i don't i don't know his name but what happened was um during the race apparently the water got really rough and the guy that was the navigator kind of chickened out and said he didn't want to be in the boat anymore so my grand he asked my grandfather to drop him off on one of these islands there off of Florida you know? <laughs> Dur during the race. Yeah, during the race, you know, somewhere off there in the Bahamas 500 race, right? So somewhere along the course, I don't know exactly where, um, but yeah. So he wanted to be dropped off. I'm done, you know. And so they couldn't uh, they couldn't run the race without a navigator. So Grandpa was all by himself, and basically decided just to come on in. Well, the water and it got bigger and bigger, and next thing you know, the boat started to swamp and get uh, started to sink and he's out there by himself. Well, grandpa always carried with him a little duffel bag and then the duffel bag, he always had his little survival gear and things in the duffel bag, right? Kept some food and, you know, peanut butter, jelly sandwich and some things. And, and, uh, he always had a little bottle of Hennessy cognac in there, right? And so he had a little bottle of Hennessy in there. So what happened as he sunk, as he was sinking, uh, he pulled the life raft jumped in the life raft, the boat sank. So now he's out floating around overnight. They couldn't find him, right? And they're doing searches, big search party, looking for Bob Nordskog out there, right? Well, Grandpa, the next day, gets picked up by some, and Grandpa called it some Russian freighter. That's what he said. It was a Russian freighter because it had red flags <laughs> on it, right? And they picked him up because they saw this guy floating out in the ocean. Well, they ended up, you know, contacting the Coast Guard and the authorities, whatever, and, you know, got grandpa back to shore. And so, you know, this, again, this went viral, extremely viral at the time. And um, all the news crews were there and asked, you know, Bob Nordscott, well, how did you survive, you know, all this time over, you know, in the seas and out the little rat, blah, 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 blah. And he, and he looked over and said, well, I had my bottle of Hennessy cognac and I was fine, right? Well, <laughs> Hennessy itself at the time, pick that up and just went themselves viral with it. This is a big story. You guys survived uh, overnight have with a bottle of Hennessy, right? Yeah. And so what they did is um, for my grandfather, after all that publicity that they got, and there's documentation on this. There's an article in Power, an old powerboat talks about this whole thing, right? So you can find it in an old powerboat. I can't remember what issue, but it's in the early 60s. Um, uh, so Hennessy does this big deal, you know, promotes... Uh, promotes this all around the world. And so they decide to give my grandfather a, a 1913 special bottle of Hennessy Cognac because that was his birth year, 1913. And they also gave him a special phone number to contact at any time, anywhere he's at. If you call this phone number, a bottle of Hennessy Cognac will be at your table within, within the hour, right? Well, sure enough, oh. and I've seen this happen when I was young a few times grandpa would get on that phone he would call within the hour you know when we're all having dinner a bottle some guy would appear out of nowhere the local hennessy rep or whatever would be there with a bottle of hennessy cognac slap it right on the table for grandpa and i know that's true because i saw it happen a lot and just a uh, quick little side note it's funny and when we did finish the canada to mexico run grandpa decided to pop the cork on that 1913 bottle of hennessy so he was pouring little drinks of that. And I actually had my first sip of Hennessy there. It didn't, it's kind of nasty, you know, a 1913 bottle. But um, that, you know, that's kind of when it got opened up. So that, that's a kind of a very interesting story, that Hennessy cognac story. That, that, that is fantastic. That is a fantastic story. I've never heard that. And I, and I can't wait to find it. If you think about it, text me. Uh, if, if you think about the issue, I'd love to see if I have it or send me some pictures. I'll post some yeah, pictures. Yeah, it's an early that's, 60s that's issue. It's Powerboat. I've seen it before. I just got to look through the issues and find it. But it's there. And I'm sure there's got to be amazing. somewhere like so. online. I bet you can find some info, info about that. I, I don't know. But, you know, it's amazing what we can find online these days. But, yeah, that's a great story. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that one. I appreciate it. And man, thank you. Thank you for coming on. And that's awesome. And you know what, we'll have to do it again. I'm, I'm, we'll, we'll take some time, get revved back up. And I'm sure you'll think of a bunch more stuff. And uh, we'll get back and do this again, because people are going to love this stuff. So thank you so much for sharing. And again, thanks for the 
you know, the Facebook page with the Bob Nordskog and the Powerboat uh, Magazine Facebook pages. And you guys look at those things. Eric's always posting cool stuff. And um, it's great Powerboat, great Powerboat history. So, yeah, thanks again. And again, Eric's uh, Eric's company is is uh, on at pro.com. And then, of course, the Facebook pages, uh, you can find them there. So uh, another place you can find Eric is um, Eric's doing some commentary for o- Ocean Cup series. Um, I've act- I actually just interviewed Janet Wilson, who runs Ocean Cup, um, and you'll probably see that episode before you see this one. But Ocean Cup is a series that is it brings back stuff like uh, the Canada to uh, Mexico challenge that Eric talked about. Um, they're they're sanctioning that for races all over the the country and the world now. And and again, Eric's been doing some commentary on that too. So why don't you go ahead and tell us what you've been doing there on that one, Eric? Yeah, it's a Nigel Hook and crew um, who are the with the Lucas Oil. I think they're not with Lucas Oil anymore, but uh, Nigel and uh, Janet Wilson contacted me uh, to get involved in that race and kind of bring back the history of the, the Rum Run race, which Grandpa actually started back in the early 60s. We I have the old Rum Run trophy actually sitting over here um, that I do bring at the race, and we start now we're adding more names to it. Um, so, yeah, the whole Ocean Cup idea is to kind of bring back the old school offshore racing, like, you know, go out to sea, you know, instead of just kind of circle racing in the in the surf, you know, and um, and they setting records and type of thing. So, um, you know, they've they had a few boats last year. Every year it's kind of building more and more boats. We're trying to get a bunch more boats out from the East Coast to, to come out here. And I'm encouraging anybody on the East Coast to come on out. It's it's really a great event. It's at Huntington Beach. And um, it's in conjunction with the uh, Pacific Air Show where the Thunderbirds and the and um, the Blue Angels come. And it's like an amazing air show that weekend. And on the Friday before they have the uh, the race. It's not an nobody races all together. It's actually staggered and timed runs now. Uh, so, you, but you do head out toward Catalina. You go around Catalina and come back to set a world's record to set records, basically for the run. So, I encourage anybody again from the East Coast or wherever to come out for this race. It's really awesome. They're doing a great job with it, and um, I'm involved with the commentary with uh, uh, Rich Lores. I did it with Rich one year, um, and uh, Martin last year. I can't. I'm sorry, Martin. I can't. Remember Martin Sanborn. Martin. Yeah, there you go. Um, we did it last year together, and um, it's it's a really great event. So come on out, and we'd love to see you. You can come talk to me. You can come uh, see the actual Rum Run Trophy up up close and personal. And if you do set a record, your your name will be on the trophy, which is really awesome. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for bringing that up. I'd almost forgot to ask you about that. So yeah, no problem. Well, cool. Well, thanks again. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll see you out there for that. I'm going to try to get out there for that. So, but thanks yeah, again. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll keep an eye on what you're doing and, and I'll share what, what I see. And, and uh, yeah, thanks again for, for all you do. And thanks for coming on. Okay. Take care, buddy. Good seeing you. All right. Thanks, man. Thank you for listening to Powerboat Talk. If you like what you've heard, please head over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five star review. For more Powerboat Talk, follow us on Facebook or Instagram or visit our website at powerboattalk.com.